See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Good morning, Shandon family. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, I invite you to open it with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 8, the book of Hebrews chapter 8, and today I want to speak to you on the subject, a better priest and covenant. As you're turning in your Bible, each week moving forward, we will have sermon notes available for you in the lobby, and so on your way in, make sure you pick up those sermon notes that we've printed out for you so that you can follow along with the sermon. But also today, we have some special guests here among us, and I want to acknowledge Dr. Tony Wolf and his wife, Vanessa. Tony is the new executive director treasurer of the South Carolina Baptist Convention following Dr. Gary Hollingsworth. Uh, Dr. Tony, are you here in the building? Would you stand up so that we can acknowledge you uh, this morning? Welcome, Dr. Wolf and his family. I know that they are here somewhere. Um, they're over here to, our, to my right, to your left. Let's acknowledge Dr. Wolf. Now, everyone, make sure that you treat them well. They are looking for a church home, so let's be on our best behavior, but uh, welcome, Dr. Wolf. Uh, we're thankful that you're here this morning. All right, Hebrews chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading in verse 23 of chapter 7 that will catch us up to speed in what we learned last week, and then I, we'll start in verse 8. So chapter 7, verse 23, the Bible says, Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day, as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, that was set up by the Lord and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, since there are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law. These serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For God said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry, and to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, he says, see, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. I show no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each his brother or sister saying, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their wrongdoing. I will never again remember their sins. By saying a new covenant, he has declared that the first is obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. We each have a decision to make. We make this decision 
almost daily. Do you buy something used or do you buy something new? Now, there are some things that I do not buy, mind buying used. I do not mind buying a used car. I'm probably not right now, but typically you can buy a used car cheaper than a new car. I don't mind buying used furniture. Maybe on Marketplace you can find a better deal than if it were online new. I do not even mind buying a new home or a used home. But, but there's one thing that, that I do not want to buy used. You say, what is that? It's a cell phone. Now, the reason that I don't want to buy a used cell phone is because as soon as a cell phone comes out, in just a few years, it's gonna be out of date. There's a design flaw to it. Now, it's not a design accident. The designers create it this way. But you cannot upload software and programming to an old phone. So eventually, that it will be in a toy box somewhere or you use it maybe for Wi-Fi, but you can't use it as a phone. We would call this, it's obsolete. It was good for a season and effective, but it's useful for a limited amount of time. It's good, but it's only useful for a limited amount of time. Hebrews chapter eight. What God's word is saying this morning is those Old Testament customs, sacrifices, religious traditions, they were useful for a season, they were good and effective, but they were useful only for a limited amount of time. There in the Old Testament, for thousands of years, the people of Israel would offer sacrifices and rituals. But now we have Jesus, who is our great high priest. He's a once for all sacrifice. And this is the argument, the backbone of the letter of Hebrews from chapters five to chapter 10. The author is telling us that Jesus is the better sacrifice. We've been learning that throughout the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is better. We've said that Jesus is better than any sin, addiction, challenge, or difficulty that you may be going through. And he's telling us, do not get over your salvation. Do not get over the cross of Christ, that what Jesus has done is significant. But if we're going to appreciate the promised plan of God and salvation, we also have to understand the past. Or if I could put it this way, if you do not understand the past, you will never appreciate the plan of salvation that was given to us in the future. See, God wanted you to draw near to him so much. He wanted you to understand Jesus that for thousands of years that he would give us shadows and types. He would say, there's coming a day, I'm, I'm giving you these pictures now, but there's coming a day when it'll all point to Jesus. So here's my assignment this morning. I want to convince you from God's word that Jesus' priesthood is better. And the author of Hebrews says there are two reasons why Jesus' priesthood is better. Number one, that he's a better priest. But number two, he offers a better covenant. So let's dig into God's word this morning. You see, he's a better priest because unlike the priest of old, he is enthroned. Now, if you were with us last week, we looked at all of chapter seven, and here's the argument of chapter seven. Jesus is a better priest. And we said that in verses one through about 10, is Jesus' priesthood better or is the Levitical priesthood better? All of the priests in the Old Testament came through the line of Levi. And then the author of Hebrews tells us in verses 11 through 18, the Levitical priesthood is inferior. Therefore, the assumption through the rest of chapter seven is that Jesus' priesthood is superior. We said that in the Old Testament, there was a separation of powers. A priest needed a prophet and a prophet needed a king. But in Jesus, he comes together as both prophet, priest, and king. So he is our priestly king and a kingly priest. Melchizedek was a type that pointed us forward to Jesus. But here's how Jesus is better. In the Old Testament, that day by day, the priest would offer sacrifices and they were always standing up. They were always working. But to sit down implies that the work has been finished. So that's why it says here in verse one of chapter eight, now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in 
the heavens. Jesus' work has been completed. Why is that? Because he is enthroned as king. Now, come in closely this morning. There are many people today who want a priest to intercede for them, but they don't want a king who is ruling over them. Many people today talk about Jesus as Lord. They might even say that Jesus is Lord. But the real question this morning, are you living that Jesus is Lord? There are many people today that they want a savior who can save them, but they don't want to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Listen, you don't make Jesus Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's who he is. He's accomplished salvation for us. Jesus, that he is Lord. If he is Lord, that means that he's Lord over every aspect of our life. To be Lord means that he's in control. He's enthroned. That means that he's Lord over your finances today if you're a Christian, or he should be. He's Lord over your family. He's Lord over your decisions. He's Lord over your ambitions. He's Lord over all of your strategies and goals in life. It's not that Jesus is just a good person plan for the Christian. Jesus is the plan for the Christian. So the author of Hebrews steps in here and he says that first of all, Jesus is a better priest because unlike the priest of old, that he sat down, he's enthroned. But then he tells us another reason why Jesus is a better priest. And it connects back to what's said in chapter seven. I want you to look at your Bible here and I want you to underline the word this in verse one. It says, now the main point of what is being said is this. Now, underline or underscore, circle that word this because it's pointing us back to chapter seven. Specifically, I want you to look at verse 25. It says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. What a remarkable thought Jesus is a better priest because he is always interceding for you. That means that Jesus right now, he is praying for you. What challenge are you going through today? What difficulty, what circumstance do you think is so great and so large that it would be difficult to overcome? And in light of all of that and what you're going through, what the Bible says is that Jesus is praying for you. The argument of Hebrews 7 and 8 is that Jesus' eternal ministry of prayer was just as important as Jesus' earthly ministry in praying. Think about the praying life of Jesus. Throughout his ministry, Jesus prayed. Now you might ask the question, what could Jesus have accomplished during his earthly ministry apart from prayer? The answer is absolutely nothing. There is no substitute for praying. There's no amount of energy or enthusiasm or eloquence or intellect or wisdom or sophistication. I am convinced there is no substitute for prayer. I love what Martin Luther said, as it is the business of tailors to make clothes and it is the business of cobblers to mend shoes, it is the business of Christians to pray. Now for many Christians today, they would say they pray in order to get their business done. They see prayer as transactional. But what he's saying here is it is the business, it is the duty of every Christian to pray. Now we pray because the Lord Jesus prayed and he showed us how to pray. I mean, think about Jesus's earthly ministry and how important it was for him to pray. Jesus commenced his ministry in prayer. Do you remember there in Luke chapter three where it says that as Jesus was praying that the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. Now, there are some people who would say, well, that's when Jesus was filled by the Spirit. But that would be incorrect because the Holy Spirit was always within him. The Spirit of God rested on Jesus. That was the moment when Jesus was anointed by the Spirit. Now, that word anointing, that means a special touch for a special task. You know, every time that we do something for the Lord, we pray, God, would you touch me? Lord, would you use me in a great way? I can't imagine getting up here Sunday by Sunday and trying to preach in my own strength and in my own power. Every time that we do a divine task, we need the Lord's enablement. 
And Jesus would pray to the Father at the beginning of his ministry, and he prayed for the Father's enablement. But not only did prayer commence Jesus' ministry, uh, Jesus' Jesus's ministry, it counted on prayer. Do you remember there in Mark chapter 1, verse 15? Jesus is performing miracles. He's healed Simon Peter's mom. That There are many things that are taking place, and the crowds are growing. People are, are coming more and more to, to hear about this Jesus. But Mark 1.35 says that early in the morning while it was dark, Jesus got up, set out, and he went into an isolated place. And there he prayed. Simon and his companions, they came to him, and they said, Lord, the crowds are growing. But Jesus said, we've got to go to the neighboring village. Jesus, he was receiving direction from the Lord. Now, any time in your life that you have a major decision, that you must pray, and God will give you direction, God will give you that stillness and that peace if you would pray. Any time that we need direction as a church, we must pray. One of the things that I've learned recently is that there is a need for more volunteers in our children's ministry and student ministry. But listen, the Bible says in Matthew 9, 38, that we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Now, a lot of times in ministry, we are so quick to want to pray for the harvest. We want to see the results. But here's what Jesus said. You pray for the laborers, and if you get the laborers right, then you will get the harvest. The laborers is the first step. What does it take to submerge a church? What does it take to sink a church? It's when a church has leaders who are not godly, who are not spiritual men and women. We should be praying that God would raise up men and women who love the Lord, who are spiritual. Jesus counted on prayer in his ministry. Jesus also, he called out for ministry in his prayer. There in John chapter 11, verse 41, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus prayed. He says, Father, I know that you hear me. You've always heard me. But I pray that you would do this so that they would believe that you, you've sent me. And then Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And there was power. Now, the reason that there was power in that moment was because Jesus deferred to the power of the Father. You look at the end of Jesus' ministry there in Luke chapter 22 in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed, Father, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He ended his ministry with prayer. Now, now come in closely. All of Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry, depended on prayer. But Jesus is not in heaven today just twiddling his thumb as if he is bored Instead, Jesus is praying for you. As important was Jesus' earthly praying ministry, it's important today that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father and he's praying for you. I mean, picture that right now. The struggle that you're going through, the difficulty, the challenge, and there Jesus is. He's advocating for you right now, praying for you. And that's why he's a better priest the priest of old just stood up, but he's seated and he's interceding for you. As we said last week, everything that is over your head is under God's feet. Every problem that seems too great for you is under the feet of God. And Jesus today, he is a better priest because he intercedes and because he is enthroned. But he doesn't stop there. We could stop there and we would be encouraged enough by the sermon. But you see the word better or superior four times in 14 verses. And this is where it really gets good because here in verse six, I want you to notice what it says. But Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry. Let me stop right there. Any ministry that we have is not an achieved ministry. It's a received ministry. If God uses you, it's not because you brought something to the table or as if you were a gift to God's kingdom. Anything that God gives you in ministry is not something that you have achieved or earned or something that it's been received. You are a steward of this particular ministry. So he says that Jesus has obtained a ministry. Who gave him that ministry? The Father. And it says to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant which has established on better promises. 
For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. So we have to ask the question, what is a covenant? A covenant is a solemn agreement between two parties. It's a contractual agreement. You have party number one that establishes the bounds and the terms and the limits of the contract, and party number two enters into the terms with no negotiations. What he's saying here, when you came to Christ, you don't get to set the limits and the the terms and the boundaries for salvation. That God in Christ has offered you this great salvation. It's a covenant. Now, there is a covenant of old, but we now have a better covenant. Now, someone is asking, does that mean that the Old Testament had faults? The problem was not the Old Covenant. The problem is us. As we've said, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The issue was us. See, the law is good. The law of the Old Testament, it was great in that it showed us what was right and wrong, what was true and not true. But the law of the Old Testament did not give us the divine enablement to keep it. So the law served its purpose. It had a purpose, but the law could not save us. There was not the divine empowerment, but now we have this new covenant. Do you remember there in Luke chapter 22 where Jesus said, this new covenant is in my blood. It was at that moment that we went from an old covenant to a new covenant. And no longer was God writing his his covenant on stones of tablet, but now he was writing his covenant on our heart. Now I find this fascinating. In the temple in the Old Testament, you had the, the place where people gathered, you had the inner court, but then you had the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies, there, there were several things. You had the Ark of the Covenant. You had the, the, the golden slab. But inside of that Ark, you had broken tablets, which represented the laws of God that had been broken. What the author of Hebrews is saying is, whereas in the Old Testament, you had stones of tablet that were broken, now we get this new covenant that enables us to keep the laws of God, and that new covenant is the Spirit of God that's within us when we are born again and given a new life in Christ. You see, even here today, I believe that there are people that may have stone hearts. You can show up to church and have a stone heart. You can even carry a Bible and open a Bible and have a stone heart. The, 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 the real question is, does the Spirit of God live inside your heart? Now, how does the Spirit of God live inside your heart? Because by faith, you've received Jesus as Savior and acknowledged him as Lord, and the Spirit of God comes in and gives you that new covenant. Now, there are three advantages to the new covenant that I want to talk about this morning. First of all, it enables true obedience. We've said during this series that God never educates us past the point of our obedience. In the Old Testament, they tried to obey, but they would have to go back to the temple time and time again because of their sins. But now, with Christ in us, there's true obedience. Now, a Christian can succumb to sin, yes, but you don't have to. Because now you have the power within you, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that lives within you. And you can obey God. There's the opportunity for true obedience. But not only true obedience, now that you fully belong. Notice what it says here in verse 10. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. You now have an identity. That identity is Jesus. Your identity is not found in how much money you make. Your identity is not based on what type of car you drive. Your identity is not located in the zip code in which you live. Your identity is not based on whether or not you receive the job promotion or have the job title. By the way, if if you won't do the job without the title, you won't do the job with the title. Titles mean nothing to God in the eyes of God. Your identity doesn't come from all of these earthly standpoints. What what he's saying here is that your identity is found in Christ and Christ 
alone. As we've said, Jesus plus nothing equals everything, and Jesus plus everything equals nothing. Now, there's a difference between a calling and your identity. Your calling is your assignment from God, but your identity is in Christ. My identity is not found in the fact that I'm the pastor of Shandon Baptist Church. My identity is found that I am a child of God. I am born again by the Lord himself. That is my identity that I am found in Christ, and that's your identity as well. May we never get over the fact that our identity is not found in all these earthly temporary possessions. Our identity is found only in the Lord. If you find your identity in anything else, your head will swell when there's success, but your heart will flounder when there's pain. But if your identity is in Christ, you know that everything is secure and complete. And because of this new covenant, not only does it give us true obedience, not only does it give us full belonging, but I love this last part. It enables permanent forgiveness. Notice what it says here in verse 12. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. So the author of Hebrews here is quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, where the prophet Jeremiah, he predicted that there was coming a day with a new covenant. This new covenant, he says here that God will no longer remember our sins. Now, is he saying that God has some divine dementia? No, that's not the case. God is all-knowing. That's part of the characteristic of who God is. He's omniscient. But there's a phrase in our culture today. You've probably heard it. Forgive and what? Forget. But I don't know about you, but whenever someone does me wrong, I just keep replaying it over and over again in my mind. Yes, I can forgive that person, but it's really difficult to, to forget. But he's saying, God... It's not that he has divine dimension, but God chooses to not hold the sins of your past against you, but instead he's blotted it out as if he no longer remembers it. He has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west, and he has forgiven us. What a great savior. But the implication goes one step further. Because if you are a believer today, if you've been forgiven a great debt, then we must be willing to forgive others. You see, forgiven people forgive people. There's someone here today that you've been holding a grudge. You're bitter, anger, angry at someone else because of what they've done to you. And you justify it because you say, well, I have a right to be angry at them. I have a right not to forgive them if you only knew what they did to me. Reconciliation takes two people, but forgiveness takes one person. And here's what I've learned about forgiveness. If you don't forgive, you're the prisoner. You're the one that's impacted and influenced. And because we have been forgiven this great dead end in the new covenant, the implication that the author of Hebrews will go on to say is that you're to forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven you. As a young boy, I heard about a story that took place here in Columbia. Many of you know the name Dawn Smith Jordan. She won Miss South Carolina years ago, but she had a twin sister, Sherry. There was someone that was trying to produce harm, stalking them without their knowledge. And one day, as Sherry, the twin sister, was going out to the mailbox, the abductor took her, thinking that it was Dawn. There's a movie made about it called Nightmare in Columbia County. At that time, the FBI set up the largest manhunt in U.S. history trying to find this individual. He was a sadistic person. He allowed Sherry to write a letter to the family just before he, he killed her. And in that letter, she, she wrote this. She said, when I was a young girl, you, you taught me, Mom and Dad, Romans eight twenty eight, which says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Do not allow 
my death to ruin your life. You're gonna be able to move on. This abductor would call the family, even with the FBI setting up shop in the area, and would call and harass them. And then he killed Sherry. Years later, as he was in prison, they found him. He was placed in prison. He gave his life to Christ. And he wrote a letter. I remember hearing this as a young boy. He wrote a letter. And he says, Dawn, I pray that you would forgive me. Since I've been in prison, I I came to Christ. And I pray that you would be able to forgive me for all that I've done. Now, I don't know about you, but in that moment, I would have a very difficult time forgiving. But the words of Ephesians 4 came to her mind. Be kind, tenderhearted to one another, forgiving others as God in Christ has forgiven you. This permanent forgiveness that God enables through the new covenant is the very strength and source through which we can forgive others when they harm us. If you're not forgiving, if you're holding on, if you're trying to settle scores or take this this wrongness that someone has done to you and you think, well, eventually that I'll get even. That's not the plan of God. What God says is that you would forgive. Why? Because God in Christ has forgiven you. Forgiven people forgive people. Jesus is better. Jesus' priesthood is better because he's a better priest. He's enthroned and he always intercedes but he also is better because he gives us a new covenant. And in this new covenant, it enables us to have true obedience. It allows us to have full belonging and it enables us to permanently forgive because God in Christ has forgiven us. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed as we move into a time of response, and the main idea of a text should be the main idea of the invitation. So what first I would Im- implore you to do today is if you were an unbeliever that you would come to Christ receive him he is better come to this Jesus who offers a better covenant and receive his forgiveness today if today you've never received Jesus for the forgiveness of sins we're going to encourage you to come forward our staff will be here and we want to lead you in a prayer on how you can follow Jesus as Savior and acknowledge him as Lord But I also believe that there are some here who you haven't forgiven. You're holding a grudge. You're trying to settle accounts. And God's spirit is speaking to you today and saying it's time to release that person, that problem over to me so that you can be free. Maybe here in just a moment that you need to come forward. You know, it's at the altar where things died that you would come forward and say, God, I'm handing this over to you. No longer trying to do it my way or handle it in my perspective, but God, I hand this to you. You've given me the strength you tell me. You've permanently forgiven me, so God, help me to permanently forgive that person who's done me wrong. There's freedom in Christ. So here in just a moment, We're gonna pray and sing. Maybe you need to come forward for baptism. Maybe today that you need to come forward in order to express your intent to join Shannon Baptist Church. We invite you to come. Why? Because Jesus is better and Jesus loves you. Father in heaven, we pray now that as we move into a time of response that you would have your way among us. Lord, I pray for those who've been holding on to bitterness and anger. Lord, that they would be able to release it into your hands. For those who need a new heart in Christ, Lord, that they would come to to you as you offer this better covenant. Lord, for those who need to make other decisions and pray, Lord, I pray that we would respond to you, Lord, because you are worthy and you are better. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.